Welcome to the Diet Doctor Podcast with Dr. Brett Scher. Today is my pleasure to be joined by Megan Ramos from idmprogram.com. She works with Jason Fung, and together they've really sort of revolutionized the concept of fasting as a medical intervention. Now, fasting is something that's been around forever, basically, in religion and in society, but really sort of shunned by the medical community until recently. And there, Megan and Jason are a big part of why that has happened. So today, I'm excited. I get to pick Megan's brain about how they started and a lot of the t- uh, tips and tricks that they use to make this safe, because there is still a concern about the safety of fasting and the efficacy of fasting and making sure you get a proper balance. And so I think that's going to be one of the main take-home lessons of this podcast today with Megan. And as she likes to say, if a little bit is good, we tend to think a lot is better. And that's not always the case. And fasting is definitely one of those circumstances. So yes, it's an incredibly powerful tool that a lot of us can use to be healthier, to treat medical conditions, but, but it needs to be done safely and with observation. And hopefully you'll learn some tips today that will help you see if fasting is right for you. And you can talk to your medical provider or you can learn more from Megan and Dr. Fung about whether it's right for you. So I hope you enjoy this interview today with Megan Ramos. Megan Ramos, thank you so much for joining me today on the Diet Doctor Podcast. Thank you, Brett. It's a pleasure to be here. You and Jason Fung are known as sort of the fasting dynamic duo, and for good reason. I mean, you really have done a great deal to revolutionize the acceptance of fasting as a treatment for for diabetes and for obesity and for metabolic syndrome, which we have such a problem with in this country and, and the world. You came to this from a very interesting standpoint, though. I mean, you have a, a very clear personal experience with this at a very young age. So tell me a little bit about that. Well, I was in my mid-20s, and I was doing prospective research on a cohort of our diabetic nephropathy or diabetic nephropathy or diabetic kidney patients, and we were looking for biomarkers to better predict their kidney outcome, trying to diagnose their kidney disease earlier. And so years had gone by. I've been in clinical research uh, for over 20 years now. Years had gone by. We're analyzing the data, and it didn't matter. It didn't matter how early you could predict the kidney damage because once the kidney damage was there, if the diabetes was still getting worse and worse and worse, the kidney damage is still going to progress. So all I was doing with my career was trying to find out when people were going to die sooner. Oh, geez. That's like essentially what it got to. And I was really frustrated. And I myself, I was very slender at the time, but I didn't eat well and I didn't eat often. So in hindsight, that's kind of funny. I realized I was fasting all the time, Um, but I I wasn't healthy still. I was diagnosed with fatty liver, liver at 12 and polycystic ovarian syndrome at 14, but I was thin. I was quite slender, but I was tired. I was sluggish. I didn't have energy. So looking back, I know I had metabolic issues. Right. I was a toffee, thin on the outside, but quite fat on the inside. And no one knew what to do with me when I was younger. They figured I grew out of it because I was slender on the outside. So when I came to this realization that you know I have this strong family history of diabetes and heart disease, and you know you just couldn't beat diabetes, like it just seemed like it was the be all and the end all. And at 25, I realized, okay, Megan, you need to take control of your own health. You need to stop living off a of French fries and pizza. You need to start eating like a responsible adult. So in that year, I started following the Canadian Food Guide, eating six small meals throughout the day, making sure I was getting in all of my fruit, taking my snacks to, quote unquote, stabilize my blood sugar levels. And I became ridiculously obese. I put on nearly 100 pounds. Wow. And my daughter kept checking my thyroid numbers, my thyroid, and everything was fine. Um, But she was insistent, and there was nothing wrong there. It was just years of poor eating habits topped off by a year of really poor eating habits that sort of did me in. And once I gained all of that weight, right before my 27th birthday, I was told I had type 2 diabetes. And to me, this is just the end. I've had 31 hours of cardiac ablation um, before my 30th birthday, so as a 
cardiologists. Uh, I can appreciate, <laughs> appreciate that. that. That's a lot of work. Um, I've had some in, uh, some minor incidences of cancer in the past that was caught very early. Um, even that, there was a chance it was caught early. I was going to be okay. Um, diabetes? No. At 27, what kind of life was I going to have? So I was broken. For a few days, I was broken. I called in sick to work, and then I finally went in. And I knew Jason, uh, Jason Fung. I've worked with him for 20 years. He was also getting frustrated. You know, he was uh, entering his 40s. He was just watching his patients get sick, getting tired of delivering bad news and not being able to do anything about it. So independently, he had started researching about diabetes, and he became pretty interested in the the relationship between religion and fasting for both the spiritual and the healing purposes. So a friend of his sort of sparked his interest. So he had some really great information, and he shared it with me, and he said, you know, there's a low-carb approach that you can do, and there's the fasting approach that you can do, and ideally you can combine them together. But I was born in 1984, so that's, that's just the year when everything sort of started to go bad and <laughs> cover a Times magazine, you know, condemning eggs and bacon and butter. Right. Those foods were prohibited for my home growing up. Right. And uh, so uh, 84, so I grew up eating the today's standard North American diet with two very busy parents. And I was sort of fortunate growing up. If I didn't like what was being cooked for dinner and wanted to order pizza, someone would get me a pizza. Um, so uh, so changing my eating habits seemed really tough. You know, Jason said, cook with coconut oil. And I said, what do you do? Like, how do you do that? I'm like, I don't even cook in this day and age. I go through drive throughs and right. that's how I sustain my life. Um, so it, for me, the fasting was easier at the start before I tried to overhaul 27 years of dietary habits. So I started fasting intermittently, and over time, I now follow a, a ketogenic diet. I, I eat everything. I eat vegetables, non-starchy vegetables, all kinds of meat, poultry, and fish, and, and great, uh, great oils, fats, butter. Um, so I don't restrict, uh, but um, back then, those foods were also foreign to me. I think the only vegetable I ate growing up were well, corn and carrots, right. pretty much. Uh, so it was a transition. But within six months, I had lost 60 pounds, which was quite nice. My A1C went down to 4.6 from 6.4. And Jason encouraged me to have an ultrasound done of my liver. Um, so there was no fatty liver. So then I went for a fibro scan just to confirm <laughs> the ultrasound. And that also showed that my, my liver was pretty clear. My lab showed my liver was functioning very uh -huh. well. And I actually started having regular menstrual cycles for like the first time since I was a kid, like 12 years old, when I started having menstrual cycles. Um, and even then, it was only short-lived for about a year before they became a little bit wonky. Uh, so that was great. And then I followed up with an ultrasound, and there appeared to be no cyst on, uh, on my ovaries. And I continued to have regular menstrual cycles without the use of any other medications to induce that. Wow. Um, what did your Dramatic story. I mean, it was really what, cool. what gets me is that fatty liver at 12, diabetes at 27, and nobody addressed your diet, right? They no thought one. you were eating perfectly and it can't be that. Let's look for every other possible reason besides that. And it took took Jason Fung to come in and sort of help work with you to, to change things. And that, uh, that sort of boggles my mind now. Um, and fasting for you proved to be so powerful. And for so many people now is is so powerful. And I think one of the most interesting things is how it's not been part of the medical community for so long and yet is such a uh, part of the religious community, like you mentioned. So Ramadan, you know, billions of Muslims are basically fasting for most yeah. of the day. The majority of religions have a fasting component to it. So why do you think it was so shunned for so long in the medical community and, and actually still is in some circles? I think it's just something that, you know, as food has become more and more abundant uh, and just easy access, I know for days when I'm working at home and I'm intending to fast, it's really tough knowing I have a refrigerator full of bacon and eggs and great meat and vegetables um, at my disposal. So, you know, food um, became a lot more prevalent. And then we had this major sort of shift in our diet. And I think we started to see a lot more carbohydrate addiction. And so you start to talk to these people, you know, I know I went through it myself, sort of that withdrawal from the carbohydrates. Right. I'm going to expose my brother here. 
who finally told me uh, on my way to this event that he's going to start fasting and going low carb. He was at a, a low carb uh, get together in Greece on an island. There is no access to anything. He was with my husband and some of our friends and uh, it was all low carb. He didn't have bread, he didn't have potatoes and he actually became almost completely delirious for about 24 hours. He collapsed. Um, it was just, it was a real nightmare. I was in Toronto so it was really difficult. I felt oh bad my for my husband. Yeah. Um, you know, so we sort of have this addiction. Actually, I have a friend uh, and he's Muslim. And he said, you know, if you look at the Quran and they talk about um, talk about dates and, you know, dates were something that were sort of supposed to be reserved. Uh, it, well, it depends. There's different variations of how you can interpret it. And he said growing up, he was always told by his parents who were much older than um, much older than the regular parents. His dad was in his in mid 50s when he had him um, that, you know, it was something that was special, sort of sacred, say for sort of towards the afterlife. Um, and then, you know, towards Ramadan, you are supposed to engage in a little bit at the end of Ramadan. And, and have a, have some dates. But nowadays, he says, you know, in his family, it's, it's totally transformed. You know, now it's sort of the more dates you eat, the closer it brings you to God. You're supposed to be eating them more often. And he said that, uh, so I, going off of him here, and he said, you know, it's it just sort of within this culture, he's noticed this big sort of shift towards, uh, I've done my fast, now I can, I, I should have more of the carbohydrates. More of the sugars and the carbs. More of the carbs. Mm. So I don't know if there's some sort of addiction factor here, and then, yeah. um, you know, all of our guidelines just, you know, recommend that we just eat so much and so often, and they're supposed to be based on science, right? But they're not. But they're not, and this yeah. is really misleading um, to yeah. so many people. You know, I grew up assuming that the people that put Together, the Canadian Food Guide and who educated my daughter or that she even had education in the first place about right. nutrition um, and that this is all backed by you know really hardcore science here and it's not and that's something that's really hard I struggle with it with patients I struggle with it with my own family yeah. the government wouldn't want to mislead us Megan they wouldn't oh do goodness. that um, yeah. so it, it's just created all this sort of resistance I think towards the idea of fasting yeah. unless you are doing it for religious purposes and also where you come from is so important because like you're saying like your brother with the perfect example if you are in a heavy carb type of nutrition and carb addicted then fasting is a lot harder than if you come from the low fat realm um, and I think that had a lot to do with it as well. So the multiple meals, frequent carbs, if you try to fast, it's going to be a disaster. So I think that brings up the importance of transitioning into a fast appropriately. Right, because a lot of people say, "Oh, well, yeah, let me give it a try," and they feel terrible. They're lightheaded, and they're dizzy. They may faint, or like sort of have the experience like your brother had. So, how do you work with people to say, "Okay, if you're if you want to try this, let's get you to do this safely"? What are some of your checkpoints and some of your recommendations? So when Jason and I first started working with patients, he's, he sees patients um, as a doctor, um, monitors them medically, and then I educate them and sort of guide them on what to do in terms of fasting and diet. But fasting wasn't really welcomed by the medical community, as even our own colleagues. They saw the transformation in me, and they said, okay, well, Megan's around doctors 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, Megan's got a lot of common sense. We know this. She's very in tune with the body. And she's young. So she would know to seek help. There's likely nothing severe is going to happen to her. It's great. But for these older sick patients and all kinds of medication with more complex medical issues, you can't fast them. So I tried working with them on the diet. But the particular location where Jason and I practice out of in Toronto is very, uh, it's just socioeconomically poor. Mm. Um, and even if people were to save to buy better quality food, there really isn't anything in the area. People often ask me if I live close by and there's just nothing. Like there's just uh, really nothing, no good quality things. You'd have to drive far to the east or to the west to get it. And a lot of these people are disabled and don't have a vehicle of their own and to take public transports out of the question. So... <laughs> It's tough. So I'm trying to work with these patients about changing their diet. And I know low carb should be affordable for everyone. I actually did a gardening class one day with some of them, trying to teach them how to grow their own vegetable garden on their balcony. Great idea. Um, but just anything. And it just was, they were sick. I mean, these people had 
parts like arms amputated, mm-hmm. such bad arthritis. Like, so do you try to use low carb as the transition point? Try and get them on low carb first, and then so into some form of fasting. This is what I do. I realize that it's just tough, and I do need to get them into a bit of a state of ketosis. When they're going from high carb to fasting, that's dangerous because their insulin levels are going to drop rapidly, and their kidneys are going to release all kinds of sodium. They're going to lose a bunch of water and a bunch of electrolytes at once, and they're going to feel horrendous. They're going to get nauseous. Fasting is not going to be a good experience for them, nor a safe experience for some of these patients. So the idea of getting them to to follow what a lot of them consider the the fancy low carb diet um, <laughs> uh, is not possible. So I get them to do something we joke around and we call a fat fast for four days leading up to an actual fast. And for those four days, they're only permitted to eat bacon, eggs, olives, and avocados. And if they don't eat bacon for whatever reason, then they have eggs, olives, and avocados. I don't care. Um, but just those four foods. And to be honest, most of them enjoy it. Yeah. Most people love at least two or three of those four foods, if not all all of them. They're all simple to make. Olives require require zero preparation. Avocados, zero preparation. Eggs can be unbelievably simple. And bacon, you can throw it in the oven or in the microwave. You don't have to sit there um, at the stove. So it's all very simple, all very easy, and things that you can get for reasonable prices if within the Toronto area. So they liked it. They liked the challenge. It became a game to them. So they would do it. They would always do it. And so they would lose the water weight safely while replenishing their electrolytes. And then they would be able to transition into fasting quite effortlessly. And once they got into a fasting state, um, it, they felt like eating less on their eating days. They wanted to eat that bacon and those eggs a little bit more often. And then because they were fasting intermittently or fasting for a couple chunks of time throughout the week, uh, like maybe two 48-hour fasts a week, they were able to actually save money. And so when they did have those community farmer's markets every now and then, they could go and they could afford to buy better quality foods. So the fasting enabled a double win for these people. It enabled them, you know, to really get control of their health, start to feel better, change their appetite and their cravings, and then it enabled them to buy the food that was good for them too in the first place. So it was a real win for everybody. So eventually, everyone we got fasting, we got to do low carb as well. That's fascinating. I love the, the double bonus that fasting really provides. And logistics, you don't have to worry about it, you, you know, time saving and money saving. So many things come into play with fasting. But I want to go back quickly to something that you mentioned about replenishing their electrolytes and losing the water rate because that's something that's very important for people to understand. Whether it's transitioning to low low carb or transitioning to fasting, that there is this naturesis, this Mm -hmm. diuresis that you're losing sodium, you can lose some potassium and you lose water rate. So what do you you specifically recommend for people um, as a means to protect against that or, or replenish that? So it depends on what fasting regimen they're going to do. Now, most often than not, uh, the minimum fast is 24 to 36. Well, the most, the minimum and the most common fast uh, we use is 24 to 36 hours, three times a week for our patient population. Uh, so during this time, of course, we assess them in the first place. Do they have a history of congestive heart failure? You know, what is their kidney status, their renal status? Um, do they have issues with elevated potassium levels already or, or low potassium? potassium levels, hypokalemia already. So we assess that all at baseline before we make any recommendations. We usually do start everybody off on sort of a base of 400 milligrams of magnesium anyways. Uh, The serum magnesium tests that we do in clinic, we do it every month. I don't know why we do it every month. They're terrible (laughs) tests. It's a terrible test. So we just sort of assume um, most of our patients at this point, you know, they're mostly quite severe diabetics uh, and have severe metabolic syndrome. That they're probably quite depleted of magnesium, so it's safe to do. And we recommend things like Epsom salt baths or making a homemade magnesium oil or purchasing one and using it topically just to help give their magnesium levels a boost. So it's a great point that the magnesium, if we take too much orally, it can give us some GI side effects, diarrhea. But our skin is actually very good at absorbing uh, magnesium. So Epsom salt baths or some topical magnesium can be a great way to do it and bypass the the stomach side effects. It's more, it's much more effective. I've I've had patients who clearly have magnesium deficiency. It doesn't matter what they supplement with. Um, It's the topical application of the magnesium that really improves their symptoms and makes them feel good again. In terms of salt, um, you know, we uh, we really recommend that patients do drink bone broth or at least a low carb 
carb vegetable broth with some added salt, a good quality salt, the Himalayan salt, Celtic salt um, in it uh, when they're especially new to fasting as their body starts to purge all that water loss. A lot of patients now are very fascinated in autophagy, so the cellular recycling process after um, I won the Nobel Peace or Nobel uh, Prize um, in medicine in 2016. People are very, very interested. You know, cancer rates are now sort of through the roof and people are looking to do whatever they can. Um, so people want to jump in on day one and start water fasting and we say, no, 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 babe, you've got to try drinking the broth first. Alternatively, some people really dislike the broth, so we'll encourage them to have sort of a quarter to half a cup of pickle juice mm. on the day. And, and people actually like that in the summer. The humidity in Toronto in the summer is disgusting. Um, <laughs> uh, so no one wants to be drinking warm chicken broth in the summertime. So pickle juice is an alternative at that time of year that will encourage patients to have, uh, of course, with no sugar in it. And we teach them different ways that they can make it at home themselves to supplement. So we usually go that route first. We find, though, if a patient's fasting consistently, they don't really need to supplement with it after the first two to four weeks once they start fasting. During that time, the first month, we see the most water loss. We see their weight loss sort of start to stabilize at about one and a half to two pounds a week after that. And you know, people start to become lazy with the broth anyways, and they don't end up having any problems. Sometimes, though, they still get more leg cramps, so we will increase the magnesium or the recommendation, you know, in terms of how often they should be taking Epsom salt baths or using magnesium oil. So important to, to you said this, but but I want to point this out again, then that's for a 24 to 36 hour yes. fast. So for a longer fast, then would you recommend that they have just have salt water or something? Absolutely. Salt water, uh, you know, it really depends on the patient and their level of activity, just how much we'd recommend. You know, for most people in terms of they're not going to have broth or pickle juice and just want to have some salty water, sort of stick to about three teaspoons or a tablespoon sort of max for a 36 hour period. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, maybe a little bit more if that patient is being very active, uh, doing weight training, for example, while they're they're fasting, uh, maybe increase it by an extra teaspoon throughout the, the fast. Now, I'm sure a lot of your patients that you see are overweight, have diabetes, and have hypertension. And I'm sure they've been told by their doctors to avoid salt and avoid sodium. Uh, do you have to break down some barriers with them to get them to accept that? And do you have patients whose blood pressure worsens when, when they supplement with salts, even though they're fasting? Have you experienced so, that? No, we really haven't. Um, they're... Uh, at the start, we don't see too much change in their blood pressure, even when we do see that water loss. Um, so the, we figure the salt intake, everything's sort of balancing out with their diet. But as they transition to a low-carb diet, most of my patients, they'll start off fasting immediately, but they'll do um, like 20% low-carb and then build up to doing some 80 90% low-carb over time. And it's when their diet really transitions to that we really see a more dramatic drop in their blood pressure. But it's tough. I've had patients jokingly threaten me uh, <laughs> about recommending salt. Yeah. saying they were going to record me and take it to the media, um, <laughs> telling them to take all of the salt. But we spend you know, time sort of educating them on salt. We created a special module that our patients do for training, sort of just understanding um, the effects of salt, the importance of salt, and you know how eliminating these processed foods in their diet. You know, we talk about you know, salt being so vital for survival, but we really utilize the whole motto that everything that's good for you is bad for you. For you in excess. And it's really, really bad for you in excess. And as human beings, we have this drive to be excessive. Uh, and this is something about fasting that's driving me a little bit nuts when I do go on social media. If one day of fasting is good for me, then 100 days of fasting Great is good point. for me. And I see this now all of the time, and it's really been in the last two years, and it's just so not that everything that's good for us is bad for us in excess. Fasting, sodium, everything, insulin, you know, insulin. Yeah. It's a really important hormone, but we know too little of it will kill us and too much of it will also kill us. Water and oxygen. Too. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So so we really try to teach the patients about this balance. And we so we talk to them about all of the, you know, refined processed salts that's in all of the refined processed foods that they're eating and, you know, sort of show them what a what a regular day eating low carb looks like in terms of sodium intake and a day of, you know, eating the standard North American diet looks like. 
spike. And then you have these days where you're not eating at all. You're still consuming a lot less sodium, even if you're guzzling a glass of salt water. <laughs> yeah. um, well, it's so interesting. When it comes to sodium, it, it I think that the evidence is fairly clear that really only about 25% of the population is even salt sensitive. But yet the recommendation is everybody should, should limit their salt. And yet the data seems to suggest a U-shaped curve that it, at the low end and the higher ends, there's sort of an increased health risk. So the majority of people cannot worry about their salt. and But adding extra at certain times, like when you're transitioning to a keto diet or when you're transitioning to fasting, yeah. can be so beneficial. So, so you mentioned if a little's good, a lot must be better. So that brings up the topic of different types of fasting because intermittent fasting is a catch-all phrase right now. And it seems to involve time-restricted eating. It seems to involve three or four-day fast, and it seems to involve 10-day fast. So how do you, and I know this is a big question that you may not be able to answer completely, but how do you break down what's the right level of fasting for the right individual? So we usually assess someone in consultation and then see how they respond um, emotionally towards the fast. But we really believe that sort of to, to beat insulin resistance, um, 24 to 36 hours of fasting is very effective. Doing that intermittently, um, that's all you really need. And it creates a nice balance. You know, the idea is to throw the body off and to not let the body adapt. You know, we always tell our patients that human beings, we're a dumb species. We're not a very bright species, but we're a highly adaptable species. So if we, if we stay in any one physiological state long enough, our body is going to adapt to it. And so we just want to confuse the body. And I found, we've been doing this now for seven years, intermittent fasting, 36 hours, three times a week, um, and people treating that like a therapy, not as a diet. We really encourage our patients to treat it like a therapy. I made such progress with my own health for six months because I treated fasting like it was my attendance at chemotherapy. And I wouldn't skip a treatment of chemotherapy if my friends wanted to go for lunch. Um, and there would be days where I wouldn't feel good, but that would be okay because it eventually it would lead to my inevitable great health. Interesting analogy. I and like that. We, we really encourage our patients to think of it as a therapy. This isn't a fad diet. This is a therapy they're choosing. And they don't have to choose it. They can go the regular route. We're happy with that. We're happy to provide them with education on diet. And they never have to fast. And that will lead to significant health improvement as well. Um, but if they're going to fast, they have to have the mindset that it's a therapy and they need to be dedicated to that therapy. And the intermittent fasting just provides that right amount of chaos for the body to prevent it from adapting, creates the right amount of life balance for the patients too. I think in 2017, we developed something called fasting burnout um, that I noticed because everyone was trying to do these five-day fasts week in and week out, but they just couldn't maintain it socially. They were getting really frustrated and then yeah. they'd stop fasting then they'd feel bad about themselves for not fasting so then they go eat that pizza and and not the good kind of crust <laughs> the the the, the carby kind of crust and then they would end up being in worse shape than they were when they first started and they disappear for a few months because they were embarrassed and yeah such a great point to be able to, to to institute fasting in a responsible way that's going to prevent that because let's be honest a lot of people have unhealthy relationships with food. And so there are some people who are going to be on the extremes. They're going to fast and then they're going to binge. Mm -hmm. And is that really doing you any good? So you have to, it, it's tricky, isn't it? To, to help people find that healthy balance um, and make sure they're doing it right. And that's where I like what you're talking about, the 24 to 36 hours, which is, you know, when a lot of people think about fasting, they think about the extended fast, but this is not that. It's much more doable for your for your social structure, for your life, and for your psychology as well to sort of prevent the the big binges. So when you say 36 hours, just to clarify, are you basically talking like you have dinner Monday and your next meal is breakfast Wednesday? Basically. That's correct, okay. yes. That's good for people to clarify. Now, when we talk about longer fasts, mm -hmm. we can start talking about some trouble that can happen. Yes. Um, and there's there has been some controversy about this and some people have given – maybe fasting a bad name altogether when they're really kind of specifically focusing on the longer fast. So at what point do we start to see problems like lean body mass breakdown, muscle breakdown? Do we start to see um, concern about permanently damaged resting mo metabolic rate, like what happened in that study with the biggest loser candidates? Yeah. When do you start to worry about things like that? 
Uh, so we don't really do a whole lot of crazy long fasting in our in our clinic, and I, I'll give you some examples of patients who have gone off the the reservation here <laughs> and haven't taken our advice. Um, it, we we do utilize seven and fourteen day fasts periodically. This is usually someone who comes in who's barely hanging on to the cliff mm -hmm. anymore. They're uh, and they've got um, their median. Uh, there needs to be something magical that happens to them, or they're going to lose their leg um, or lose another limb or start dialysis, uh, something pretty clinically significant, or their blood pressure is just really high and uh, we need to get them to lose weight. They're young, younger guys. So even in these patients, um, you know, it, it's very rare that we recommend it. When, um, when we first started IDM and first started fasting, we're, we're going back to 2012, and I started fasting myself in 2011. And uh, we got all kinds of flack from the medical community because of what I was doing and how could these doctors in my network be supporting me. And then we just got flack with patients. And so I think to def – and all we were trying to do was 24 to 36 hours of fasting. We weren't trying to do anything else. We made patients sign contracts promising us they went fast beyond 36 hours. Interesting. And that they would have something to have. Um, but then we were getting all kinds of flack um, for, for fasting. And so, uh, my, my colleague, uh, Jason, he speaks at a lot of conferences and he's like, you know, there's these, these studies have done people fasting for seven days and 14 days in Ramadan and they're all fine. And then, um, I think we sort of got pigeonholed into maybe we're this group of individuals at this clinic that has everybody fasting for two weeks at a time or 30 days. And that's not what we ever do. Um, but I, over the last several years, fasting has definitely become quite popular. And uh, again, our nature is if something's good for us, then a whole lot of it must be better for us. So we do have some patients who just don't listen to us. Not at all. So I have this one patient, I love him to death. His name's Paul. He's got this whole Twitter feed about this and he, he encouraged us to share his story. Um, and uh, he came in on his first appointment and uh, he said, you know, I'm, I'm going to be your, your best patient ever. And I said, all right, Paul, well, <laughs> I look forward to working with you. Um, and he wanted to do a seven-day fast. And you know what? He was a pretty severe diabetic, but otherwise completely healthy, good blood pressure. Why not? So um, he spoke to Jason and I, and we consented to the seven-day fast. And then he wanted to do 14 days. And then around the 14th day, he said, you know, my, my goal is actually 120. So we both said to him, no. Like, I, I half of his chart is me documenting uh, that I've told him to stop fasting. <laughs> um, but he continued to fast for all 120 days. Now he stopped losing weight around day 90. Hmm. Um, his blood sugar levels improved significantly, came off of his insulin and his metformin. And, um, but they didn't improve beyond day 90. Seemed like all of the magic for him sort of stopped around day 90. His fatty liver improved dramatically. We did a baseline ultrasound and a follow-up ultrasound. Um, that improved, but he also had his body composition analysis done at the start and after, um, so after he broke the 120 day fast. Now when he broke the 120 day fast, we put him on a bone broth fat, uh, protocol for a few days and slowly started to reintroduce food because we never had anyone do that before, nor would we ever encourage it. And we completely discourage him from doing right. it. But the concern of the refeeding syndrome, syndrome. which can be life threatening. Well, yeah. he, uh, so he was perfectly okay, but there was no, uh, no change in his lean mass really from start to finish. Um, it had gone up a uh, little bit, but he had also lost a nice chunk of body fat too right. during that time. So you'd expect it to go up, but there was really no change. Now when you fast, you produce quite significant growth hormone, uh, even just in one day of fasting, your growth hormone nearly doubles. So this sort of protects, you know, your body and helps it grow, especially when you start to eat again and, and refeed again. So, um, and he was also very active during his fast. He would send me photos or post photos on Twitter and tag me in it of him digging up this trench in his backyard for a garden. And he was very active. He owns a spa um, in a community near our, our clinic. And he says he's on the go there, moving things around. Mm -hmm. 
phones mm-hmm. up and down all day long. So he stayed pretty active. Um, so, you know, we, we do see um, sort of between, it's actually between the 24 to 36 hour mark during one of these longer fasts. And there's good research to support it. But during the 24 to 36 hour fast is when we do see a lot of gluconeogenesis and we do see protein breaking down. But after that 36 hours, it really sort of starts to stabilize and plateau or it starts to drop and then it stabilizes and plateaus at a really long or really low level. Um, So it's never really been an issue. Um, So I work with two patient populations nowadays, especially since fasting's become quite popular. So there's the older, elderly, metabolically um, unhealthy uh, patient, and then there's the young hotshot superstar um, who's got some sort of injury and, and wants to heal himself so he can go compete for another couple of years and be able to retire down in Miami and play golf all day <laughs> long. Interesting. Um, so most notably is George St. Pierre. So George St. Pierre, is, he's Canadian, uh, and he's a UFC fighter, and he's won some world championships. Uh, he's a very, very nice Canadian man. <laughs> man. Uh, and he was diagnosed with colitis, and as a result, he had to surrender his world title. And he was interested in fasting because his manager, being in Canada, had heard about us, and his manager fasted and reversed his borderline diabetes and lost weight. And uh, uh, as George would joke, he said he went from looking just terrible to looking fantastic. So I figured fasting has to be good. Um, And so he had colitis and he wanted to treat it with fasting. So this is a man who very clearly, if you look at him, is about 7% body fat (laughs) and is just the insane amount of lean mass and who trains very hard and aggressively and whose livelihood depends on it. Um, so he, uh, and he's like, he's human and he's like most of us. So, you know, if a little bit of fasting is good for us, well, then maybe trying to do a lot of fasting is great for us. So once a month, he does a four day fast and he talks about this very openly. He's talked about it on other podcasts and he's written some stuff for us. Um, and he trains, he was, he did a four day fast, but he was training aggressively in Thailand, um, earlier this year and he has not lost any lean mass. He's only gained lean mass throughout. All of this. So it seems like the secret might be the physical activity and the continued training. And then, because there are some studies that show some loss of lean body mass, but I guess I'd have to go back and look at those if they controlled for physical activity, because it seems like that might be the secret here. It might be. Yeah. But, but interestingly that you still, you still try to focus on the shorter fast and these longer fasts are the rare exceptions, but it seems like if the right precautions are taken, you can maybe protect against that lean body mass. It loss depends as well. on the individual too yeah. and the other health challenges they have. You know, I personally have only done 11 days once, yeah. only one time ever. Um, I'm a big believer that if I'm going to ask a patient to do something, I should have a little bit of experience doing Makes it sense. myself. Sure. And it was shortly after the first 14 day fast we ever recommended. Um, and I made it to 11 days because it was my mother's 60th birthday. <laughs> <laughs> It's a good reason to break it. Yeah. So, well, so there's loss of lean body mass, but then there's also a reset of your resting metabolic rate. And so initially after the first couple of days of a fast, the resting, resting metabolic rate actually goes up. And then after that, it seems to maybe stabilize and then come down at some point. And the question is, where is that irreversible? And I don't know the answer to that question, but the the study that was done at the Biggest Loser contestants, that seemed to be irreversible. That seemed to be years later, their resting resting metabolic rate was still diminished by 20%. Um, Some some people have called them metabolically broken. Uh, And that's something that you never want to happen, so you have to protect against. So what what kind of safeguards do you have in place to protect against that with fasting? We just don't recommend these longer fasts because there's so much unknown about there. I think um, I, when I when I uh, actually presented a little bit on this earlier this year in Breckenridge, Colorado at Low Carb Breck, there just needs to be more data on these long-term studies. A lot of the other studies too, their patient population is, years ago was very different than our patient population now. Um, so I, I just think there needs to be more evidence for that. It, it's funny that you mentioned the biggest loser. So we are working with a small group of them um, to see uh, with the combination of fasting and a ketogenic diet what we can do in terms of boosting their metabolic rate. So we're actually going to share that earlier next year because we've had some really exciting, exciting results. But even with this group of individuals, we're doing 36 hours intermittent fasting. And with that, you you 
see that it's actually boosting their metabolic rate. It's actually pretty cool. Oh, it's fascinating. I look forward to seeing that that evidence. And now, you've already started coming out with some evidence with your well with your case series report, and this was excellent. I mean, these I'm going to look this up here. You had three people on an average of 70 units of insulin each. And you did a 24-hour fast, three days a week, with low-carb and time-restricted eating. So it was a combination of effects. Mm -hmm. And they they all came off their insulin and most of their oral diabetic medications, which by itself is amazing. But then what really amazed me was some of them did it within five days. And the range was only five to 18 days. It amazed me how quickly they were able to do that. So tell me about your experience with those patients, and were you surprised? Were you, I mean, how do you interpret that? <laughs> so those three patients were totally picked by the completely random. Jason's nephew started writing the paper, and he came into my office. I was really busy, and he's like, I need three charts because I have to write I have to write about patients. So I grabbed three charts blindly really? <laughs> on the top of my counter. So I'm sure most people thought for sure these were cherry-picked <laughs> no. patients because they're so dramatic. We've got some, uh, some really interesting uh, data, and we're actually working on collecting our data. I was actually hoping to present um, before the end of 2018 uh, some of our data, but we're actively entering it all. Uh, it's it's different for everyone. It's it's amazing. We've seen people come off of like 200 units of insulin in less than a week, um, but then we've seen people who it takes a few months to come off of 200 units of insulin. Um, but it's pretty remarkable. I'd say m- most of the time when a patient comes in in consultation and they say to me, you know, okay, I'm on 110 units of insulin, when can I come off of this? Say I listen to your fasting and your diet advice, and I said anywhere from tomorrow to six months from tomorrow, Uh, (laughs) somewhere in that window. Set the expectations. Set the expectations. But most of the time, within 30 days, I'd say that they're off of insulin, and within six months off of all of their um, oral diabetic medications. No, but that can get really tricky, and that's one of the most important things for people to hear. If they're on insulin, if they're on other oral hypoglycemics or other diabetes medications, this is where you need an expert helping you because this can get very dangerous very fast. I'm sure you've seen cases and heard of people like trying to do this on their own, or trying to do it without proper supervision who've who've had some bad outcomes. So the insulin is one thing. I mean, you need to um, cut the insulin down probably pretty quickly uh, to prevent hypoglycemic episodes. Um, but then there are the oral oral agents as well. And one that's come into the news a lot is the SGLT2 inhibitors, which on the one hand have been praised because they're one of the few oral diabetic medications that have shown a slight decrease in cardiovascular outcomes. Um but yet they've also shown some evidence of diabetic ketoacidosis, the, the feared complication when people think of ketosis that is completely separate from nutritional ketosis, except maybe in people taking the SGLT2 inhibitors. So how do you handle those medications now? So for a long time, uh, we tried to utilize them in clinic. You know, they, they were, again, they're the one medication or class of medications that removes the sugar from the body, therefore sort of eliminating part of the problem. Um, and there's some cool data out there sort of showing that they do have a little bit of cardiovascular and renal protection. So again, with us being a renal clinic, first and foremost, um, you know, we tried to keep the SGL2T inhibitors um, in play for as long as we could. But uh, people, you know, our patients, we see them every week for a long time. We see them every two weeks. At the very least, we see them once a month. And we see them for an hour when we see them. So we are able to pick out a lot of information with them over the course of that hour, you know, if they're experiencing any sort of side effects. Um, but the, the reports now, there's a lot of commercials um, that are scaring the patients a little bit about them. And then just at the risk of people, you know, having this sort of excessive nature now towards fasting. Oh, now we're just concerned about leaving the patients on these SGLT2 inhibitors. For the shorter fast, we weren't as concerned. But now that society is embracing fasting and doing it to the extreme, we're actually starting to eliminate that um, or that class of medications first before any of the other medications. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And you know, one of the things I find so interesting is pe- people love this, these medicines now, especially if you look at the most recent guidelines that came out, which, by the way, low-carb diet were finally mentioned in, but they were mentioned in like half a page of a 12-page document that was all about medications. They love, people love these medications because of the cardiovascular benefits. But let's, I mean, if to be honest, they were pretty small and can we get the same benefits not using a medication but using nutrition and fasting? That's, you know, sort of what we came to the conclusion of at the end yeah. of the day too. 
Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. So we've talked a little bit about exercise um, and maintaining the body mass. Now, some people are going to have a hard time exercising when they fast or if they do physical jobs. Um, is that something you address with people and do you have any sort of tips for them? It's something way? everyone's very concerned about. I'd say every day in my email, my IDM email, I get questions about this from patients and from strangers yeah. uh, asking about it. And it's something that I'm chronically tagged in on different social media. And I know Jason experiences the same. And our patients, especially those who have labor-intensive jobs, they're nervous about it too. And we just really educate them on the importance of staying hydrated. If they're not going to drink broth or pickle juice, have that salty water, drink it and teach them sort of to hydrate. You know, and we tell patients, you know, when you drink a glass of water you know, with some salts, you're not instantly hydrated. It's not, it's not magic. It doesn't happen like that. So if you're planning to go to the gym at six, then at five o'clock, you should have a glass of water with a little bit of salt in it, let it properly absorb um, in your body, and then make sure you're hydrated before and after. A lot of people, it's funny, and they would come back and their personal trainers, for instance, would be just livid with them that uh-huh. they were fasting, especially at their age and their health status. How could they fast? They needed to focus on their fitness. Um, but then the trainers are commending them, you know, on what a great workout they were having. Gosh, your workouts have improved. And they'd say, you know, we're fasting. And so I started doing weight training about a year ago. Myself and my trainer, she's a female, females, there is more resistance out there from the female population about fasting. Um, And uh, she was very leery about it. uh, But there are some people that she worked with who really thought what we were doing in Toronto was cool. So she kept uh, she kept quiet about it, and uh, now we sort of play this game whether she guessed whether I'm in a fasted state or a fed state when I'm working out, and she said, "Megan, you finally have convinced me <laughs> to oh, start funny. start fasting." So she just started doing sixteen eight. If you hydrate properly, you're perfectly okay. You know, I think we've had a. We've had a couple of blessings or benefits. Um, the first one is being where we're located in Toronto. Toronto is the most multiculturally diverse city in the world. Uh, over 50% of the population was not born in the city of Toronto. And then in all of the different boroughs within the greater Toronto area, we're in the most diverse area. So when I tell a patient to fast, they say, okay, you know, we did that before we moved to Canada and there was uh, fast food on the corner of every street and we made more money and could afford these luxuries. So no problem. And then those patients would do well. And then they would inspire the patients who grew up in Canada, like me, you know, meat and potatoes, pasta and pizza and, and eating several times throughout the day. And those patients would see that the other ones could do it. So that was um, that was one of the blessings. The second blessing is that sort of it's in this day and age where people are really starting to question everything they've ever been told from any other doctors or media outlets about food and nutrition. And so they see me. They hear my story, they see a few other patients and hear their stories and see that, okay, they're doing this and this is okay. And, you know, they they start to realize now that the dietary advice, the medical advice they were given was wrong. And, you know, it's not that their doctors are bad people or doctors were poorly educated people and the guidelines, they we teach them about how the guidelines came to be and how, you know, it's not really based on good science or science really <laughs> at all. And so they start to question that. So they're willing to try. So Megan, if you say adding a little pinch of salt to my bone broth and drinking that an hour before my workout's not going to kill me, what do I have to lose at this point? And if it's worked for you and it's worked for them and all of the standard advice isn't working for anybody, then I'll give it a try. So that's sort of the second blessing is that we're at this pivotal moment you know, where people just don't know what to trust or what to believe. So they're going to gravitate towards what they see is working and they're going to try to educate themselves. And they're really open to listening to everything that I'm, I say. Our patients go through a 12-hour pa- training program um, immediately after their consultation while we wait for their blood work to come back and decide what it is we're going to do. Uh, so providing them with the education And 10 years ago, to ask people to take time off of work or from their personal lives to devote to that, 
they probably think it was pretty silly and they'd lose money from work. It'd be, it, they'd have to find daycare for their kids. It'd be difficult. Um, but now they're making that time because they just don't know what to trust uh, out there. They just see headlines with very poor explanations under them. So they make the time to educate themselves. So we're, we're, um, we're in this cool stage where you know people are really trying to get control of their own health and be their own health advocates. And I think that's why we've had a lot of success. Yeah, that's a great sign to, to see people so interested and, and to know they're, they're going to get the benefit. I mean, that's yeah. that's the thing. They, they're seeing other people benefit. They're seeing it, whether it's online or in person, so they know it's worth the investment. Now, one of the interesting things, though, is this whole concept of the duration of fast, like we spent so much time on, versus time-restricted eating. Mm -hmm. And it seems, sounds like you use both of those. And you mentioned autophagy. Um, we, you know, there's evidence about stem cell regeneration. There's evidence about, you know, trying to keep mTOR quiet. And now there's this fasting mimicking diet that's come on the scene. So tell us how, do you, first, do you utilize fasting mimicking diets at all? And in whom do you use them? What version? What are your recommendations about that? So we don't use them in okay. our clinic. Um, most of the patients are quite sick, and it's going to take a more aggressive approach. And perhaps um, a fasting mimicking diet is good for the healthy individual looking to stay healthy and just shape up their eating habits and their meal timing habits. But for sick metabolic patients, it usually takes something pretty aggressive. Often 24 hours doesn't quite cut it. That extra 12 hours getting to 36 hours seems to make a real difference a huge impact on patient outcomes, uh, so we don't we don't utilize it. Now that being said, I have a lot of patients who have tried it because the idea of actual fasting is very overwhelming to them, and that they just have this addiction. You know, they've been eating every two hours they're awake. You know, for the last. 10, 20, 30 years, and this whole idea of going without food is very difficult for them. Um, I have some patients uh, that I've worked with in the past, too, who grew up under very hard circumstances, food stamps. Food was very scarce growing up. I had some people that grew up during the Vietnam War and who would go months without having access to foods, and they suffered true malnutrition. And uh, for them, it's it's a little bit more tough. And uh, we've, we've worked with time-restricted eating patterns with them instead, but even them have tried doing more of a fasting mimicking diet. For them, we just haven't found that it's worked very well for our patients who are metabolically sick. Yeah, I think that's a, it's an interesting answer because you're, I think you're right that people who are metabolically sick, sick are going to need a, something a little more aggressive. And the, the fasting mimicking diet seems to be more in sort of the longevity scene now, not the people who are trying to fix diabetes or insulin problems, but trying to trying to keep mTOR low and trying to keep IGF-1 and reduce the risk of cancer. And it's really not even fasting. It's basically calorie restriction. So whether you're eating a, you know, an avocado and some olives um, and doing that for five days and keeping the calories down, it's interesting that you can see some ins insulin benefits, but I I'm interested in your experience there that it's not maybe the most beneficial approach for the people who really want to reverse their diabetes quickly. That doesn't hasn't worked with patients, and then they get really nervous that they're going to have to start fasting. Yeah. We just work on it slowly, you know, three meals a day without snacking, trying to move that dinner meal up an hour or two earlier on in the day so there's a bigger gap between dinner and breakfast. Then letting the patients guide us a little bit. Um, you know, if they're not really hungry in the morning time, well, then let's kick out breakfast. Yeah. Or if they feel pretty satiated after they eat lunch and don't really feel like they need to eat dinner or socially need to eat dinner for family reasons, then try eliminating dinner and just do it really gradually. We like to always tell our patients, you know, fasting's like a muscle and some people are just naturally more fit or inclined than others. Uh, some people have practice at it. Um, and some people have never had practice at it. They're brand new to it. So it just uh, it's going to take time to work up to where they need to be. There's a lot of patients who I know who aren't going to um, benefit unless they're doing 36 hours of fasting. Um, but I have to start them off at three meals a day and maybe a 13-hour fast and slowly transition them up to that point. And, of course, they do get benefits along the way. They lose some weight. They reduce their, their medications. Um, but they make the most dramatic impact. Um, once they get to that 36 hour mark. Yeah, that's, that's a great lesson. I think a great place to sort of leave this conversation with that you, it's not always that you just jump right into it, but sometimes you do have to ease into it and be safe and you're going to get there. You're going to get the results. Just do it safely. It just takes time. Yeah. 
Well, fantastic, Megan. Thank you so much for joining me. If people want to learn more about you and Jason and the program you have, where, where can they go to learn more? Online, uh, you can go to uh, idmprogram.com. We have a whole bunch of information up there, and you can find all of our social media links on idmprogram.com as well. Great. All right. Well, thanks again for joining us in the Diet Doctor podcast. Thanks, Brett. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.